Hello, everyone, and greetings to everyone around the country. I'm Kimberly King. I'm a psychology and ethnic studies professor at Laney Community College in Oakland, California. I'm active in the movement to defend public education and in the movement to defund and abolish the police and reconstruct public safety on campuses and in our communities. I'd like to welcome you today to Public Education, What Should It Be Now? A discussion hosted by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. COVID had, has had an impact on public education, but public education was under attack long before COVID. We're excited to host a dialogue among committed fighters for public education from around our country. Here's the purpose that frames today's discussion. People today broadly recognize that the situation in public education and elsewhere as well is such that we can't succeed by just changing one thing. Changes are necessary at the root of society and public education. People are beginning to discuss how to create truly equal public education as well as deal with the reality they face on a daily basis. We have an interesting panel for you today that's really representative of the base of the public education struggle. Someone who represents the community, a student, two rank and file teachers who are also mothers, one moderator who is a student and the other moderator who's a mom and works and represents the community colleges. I'd like to introduce our moderators now. Dr. Jesus Estrada is a member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, Chicago chapter. Ms. Jesus is a, Dr. Jesus is a college educator and the chapter chair of her labor union. And her co-moderator is Mr. Aaron Goodwin. Aaron is a graduate student and teaching assistant in the mathematics department at UC Riverside. Aaron, as an undergraduate, was involved in campus organizing through the Brandeis Labor Coalition and Brandeis Students for Justice in Palestine. Aaron is currently a member and organizer of the United Auto Workers Local 2865, which represents 19,000 student workers across the University of California system. We look forward to a great discussion today. Turn it over to Hesu and Aaron. Hi, thank you, Kimberly. Um, so I'm really excited for this discussion. I just wanna go over some ground rules before we begin. Um, so this event is being recorded and it's being live streamed to Facebook and YouTube. So if you do not wish to be recorded, you can now take the opportunity to turn your video off or uh, change your name on Zoom, uh, whatever you prefer. Um, and so we're gonna start with a question, questions for our four speakers. And each speaker will have about 15 to 20 minutes to answer each question. Uh, so maybe each speaker uh, can try to keep it to around a five minute response for each question. Uh, we ask everyone who is not speaking uh, to mute their phones while they're not talking. Uh, so there's no disruptions. And uh, we will be moderating the chat after the speakers. There will be a portion for questions and answers. Uh, so if you want, have a question you wanna ask, you could put it in the chat. And depending on the flow of the conversation, we will call on these questions and we'll either ask the question ourselves or we'll give you the chance to ask your question directly to the speakers. Um, so we're gonna get to the speakers shortly. I just wanna give uh, Hezu the chance to say hi and uh, briefly introduce ourselves. Thank you, it's such a pleasure to be here and see all of you. And we have 47 people participating, which just goes to show how much people care about education. So I'm really glad to be here and also encourage the speakers to, to talk to one another, ask each other questions as well. So looking forward to a productive conversation. Thank you again. Thank you. So the order of our speakers is going to be uh, first Maya Suzuki Daniels, who is a organizer and educator with the United Teachers of Los Angeles, the uh, teachers union. Uh, then we will have Nicole Reed McCormick, who is a teacher and rank and file organizer in West Virginia. We will have Ernesto Beltram Feliciano, who is a teacher and a member of the Puerto Rican Teachers Union. Um, and we will have Mike Hutchinson, who is a defender of public education 
and on the Oakland School Board. Uh, so first, I want to uh, ask this first question, which has two parts. Part one is going to be just to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about the work you do, um, whether you're all educators, but whether you see yourself as an activist or an organizer or a revolutionary, in whatever capacity uh, you see yourself doing this work, uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, that process. And the second part of this first question is uh, to talk a little bit about what we've seen in the past year. Uh, there are a lot of educators here, and so a lot of us educators are familiar with kind of these uh, very remarkable changes that have happened during COVID. Some things are quite different, uh, and a lot of pro problems that had already existed have been exacerbated. Um, so the, the two parts of this question are one, to introduce yourself, and two, to talk a little bit about the changes we've seen in public education during COVID. So Maya, why don't you uh, take it away? Thank you so much. Um, thank, you, thank you everybody for being here and thank you so much to the organizers for putting this on. Um, I am a mom, a teacher and a unionist slash union organizer in Los Angeles. I'm working really hard to not compromise or give up any one of those identities, but rather to see how they can work in conjunction with each other. Um, I'm also a site rep with United Teachers Los Angeles, so that means that I am directly responsible for um, enforcing the working conditions of the members at my site and making sure that we have the tools that we need to organize for better working conditions from the ground up. Um, COVID-19, that's such a big question. Um, like you said, COVID-19 has thrown a lot of systems into question. I think that a lot of people are, ugh, I use the word disorienting a lot right now um, because I think that after 13 months of this, we are not really sure if we are experiencing a temporary change in conditions, if this is permanent, what will be permanent. I very much feel like things are in flux right now. Um, and those systems are, you know, health systems, business systems, government systems, and all different industries are really struggling with how do we adapt to something that affects all of us. And I think that that's a really interesting thing that the virus has brought out is that it doesn't discriminate between people's, I mean, there are certain levels um, within our systems, but largely this isn't an enemy that you can pay or bomb to go away. Um, and I think that that's something that a lot of different sectors of society are struggling to respond to because those are our typical tools of, of um, you know, fighting back. Schools are reacting to these changes um, largely that we're seeing in other industries, but I will say that I have not seen that schools are proactively responding. I've seen that schools are largely, and public education and public educators are very much in a defensive stance um, and are not necessarily doing I won't say doing the work, but I would like to say, see more um, of us coming forward and building that grassroots power to say, this is the kind of education that we wanna put forward instead of consistently reacting and responding to attacks from various different sectors or um, various different, I hesitate to call them enemies, but you know, people who, who don't necessarily have the best interests of our students or our labor in mind. Um, so with that, I just want to say again, a huge thank you um, to folks who have shown up today on a Sunday. Thanks to my mom who's here. And also really thanks to the organizers for bringing Nicole and I in. Um, one of the things that has been consistently frustrating in the last 13 months is how often moms and teachers are being left out of decision making. So I'm super grateful not only to be here, but to have been billed uh on on as as you know our voices matter and and we are people with with things to say so thank you so much for including us in that way thank you maya it's so great to have you here um so speaking of nicole she is our next uh speaker so uh nicole do you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what we've seen in this past year sure and just to kind of echo what she said it is very nice to be invited and um for a very long time West Virginia always felt like the butt of the joke and that we didn't matter because we were poor and tiny and uh, didn't have a lot of political influence. So it's very nice to be recognized that we are important too um, and as a mother and an educator. So this is my 12th year of teaching, which doesn't seem in some ways it's been that long and in other ways it feels like I should be ready to retire. I have um, four children that are 10 and younger. Three of those are biological and I adopted one. 
and my my husband I'm married and we've been married for goodness 15 years we got married very young because uh, I'm only 36 now <laughs> um, and he is an educator as well and he works with children that struggle with truancy issues um, to help them get across the finish line and so I'm very proud of the work that he does and for me I uh, was the president of one of the largest locals in West Virginia in Mercer County for several years and we moved and now I feel very disconnected. Uh, I am no longer a president and my local is very small and weak and I'm the secretary, I'm a site rep. I'm also a founding member and on the steering committee for the West Virginia United Caucus, which is part of UCOR, uh, which is through facilitated through labor notes. And so like UTLA has leadership that are part of the caucus as well. So it's a, a very nice connection to have. So I teach, I teach music and I currently teach kindergarten through sixth grade. And this year has been very different because we're not allowed to sing um, because that COVID is spread so easily by air. So typically kindergarten through second grade journal music is like 90% singing. <laughs> so it's been a very interesting year to figure out how, how do we go about that? Um, we've been back in person pretty consistently since October, um, they pushed the start, bake, start date back until Labor Day, but um, we've been, you know, we've had some outbreaks and we've done some hybrid this and that, but in one of the unfortunately sad things about living in West Virginia, other than, of course, the poverty and the fact that we have so many grand families and great grandparents raising small children, is that um, internet is, uh, it's, it's a commodity. <laughs> It's something that a lot of people can't afford. And if you live very far back in the mountains, you just do not have access to it. So it's been very difficult to try to facilitate online learning for people that have no access to it. Or they're living with grandparents that are 90 years old that have never really had the experience that we've kind of all had uh, with, with technology. And there hasn't really been the training opportunities to kind of bridge that gap for them. And as far as how I see myself, um, I see myself as a leader. I see myself as a mother. And um, I also see myself right now as kind of tired. <laughs> like Amaya said, it's been kind of like this. Um, it hasn't been proactive. It's been very reactionary to this entire situation. And a lot of that is just feels like that we, um, I kind of feel like that I'm just blowing in the wind, like that I have no control over what's going on and I'm just being kind of pushed around, which is not a place that I'm comfortable with because I'm used to being able to say, no, this is not okay. And knowing that I have people standing with me and being in the middle of nowhere with, and, and in the process of building power, it has made it very difficult for me personally. Um, but I also like to see myself as hopeful because of the conversations that we're going to have today, because of the fact that even though that, you know, I might teach kids in the middle of nowhere, 45 minutes from a grocery store, my issues are probably similar to what Maya has. My issues, probably even Ernesto, there's probably going to be similarities in what that our students have to deal with and how that we try to meet those needs. And the last thing I would say is uh, about COVID is I, it's, it's kind of a sick gift that it's laid bare all of these issues and it's made the public and even politicians who are very, very tone deaf um, see that food and childcare and healthcare and all of those things have been taken on by schools. Now, I do believe that, that those should be the responsibility of the government as a whole and, our, and that's our society should be structured to handle that and education should be education. But you know, if, if that's gonna be the responsibility of schools then we have to fund them and treat them like that so that they can be the community schools that they need to be to fill in those deficits. And so the amount of food that has been um, sent out and during this uh, pandemic was even shocking to me. And I've always been kind of involved in that. So, um, but yes, I'm hope and I'm really appreciative for the conversations today. Well, thank you for bringing up those important points. Um, yeah, I'm, I was especially uh, resonated with that point that education and healthcare and all these things have become the responsibility of schools, which they're not, it isn't being, it's the reality, but it isn't being acknowledged. Um, so next, uh, our next speaker is Ernesto. Uh, do you want to go ahead? 
Uh, well, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I have a, a short acceleration to make uh, today. It was or originally planned that Mercedes Martinez, uh, president of the Teachers Federation of Puerto Rico, was going to be here today. But she's having a little bit of a burnout, a lot of responsibilities, since, especially since yesterday was May Day. And they also have a lot of activities inside the Federation in the next few weeks that, well, she needed a little bit of time. And, but she sent a, mess, a short message over here that I'm going to read uh, now. The Teachers Federation of Puerto Rico expresses its solidarity to the working class in the U.S., particularly our comrades that have been leading the fight in defense of public education. Our children and youth de deserve better. That's why we are determined to continue lifting our voices and organize our communities to be able to transform our school system in an emancipatory liberators one. We dream of another world, which is possible, and then we build it. Knowing that that truth, this pandemic teachers have been the backbones that have maintained our system functioning to make them heroes. We know we are in this together. Yesterday, we had a massive working class international day in, in PR in Puerto Rico. Thousands took it to the streets. We are talking about transforming the education system. And for that, we need to look into the roots of the problem, capitalism, and eradicate it for good. We are ready. Lucha si, entrega no. And that's the message that Mercedes Martinez leave us. Uh, for another way, I'm not part, I'm not a teacher. Um, I'm not part right now of the Teacher Federation of Puerto Rico. I'm actually right now a student in the University of Puerto Rico. I'm, I'm part of the student movement, participated in the student strike in 2017. Uh, it was a big student strike that lasted 72 days, uh, compromising the 12 campuses of the university. And I'm also a member of the Union of Socialist Youth uh, in PR. Um, well, in higher education in Puerto Rico, I think the circumstances have been a bit different from the public education, right, of the elementary, intermediate, and high school level. Uh, from a standpoint, the situation we face inside the classroom have been very peculiar. They have exacerbated the problems that we already had, like access to the internet, uh, who gets to got a working space to study for participating in the university, how professors evaluate our students, and how the administration treats the students that can be able to continue uh, because of the pandemic and the situation. And I think there's been a lot of trouble and at least in the university, in contrast to the elementary, intermediate and superior and high school level, uh, there's a difference in between that. While right now that we are approaching a semi ending of the COVID with all the vaccination levels uh, rising, uh, they want to return the students back to school in in public schools, but in the university, they still don't want. And they have taken this opportunity of being in distance, of being virtual inside the university, to push even further budget cuts to the university, destroy the retirement system, and create more tuition right hikes for the students in the future. And well, the situation is not, uh, it's not the best. The students uh, need to look forward to see what can be done. And the administration and the government is using this opportunity to keep with their austerity measures in the, in the system. Thank you, Ernesto. And our, our final speaker on this question is Mike Hutchinson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, First, thank you for, for hosting this event. It's, it's always nice to see so many uh, familiar faces also. Um, my name is Mike Hutchinson. I am a proud graduate of Oakland Public Schools, a co-founder of Open Oakland Public Education Network, a founding member of the Journey for Justice National Alliance, um, and now a newly elected school board director here in Oakland in District 5. Um, this has been a big year for us in Oakland, both politically and for me personally. Um, I ran a campaign during COVID um, and we had a huge breakthrough here in Oakland 
where we were taken over by the state of California 20 years ago. Um, and my election really represented the first time we've broken through to really regain local control uh, since the state takeover in 2003. Um, so we are really excited about the changes that are coming. Um, and I don't know yet if it would have been possible without COVID. I am very close now to starting to frame COVID as a positive experience for us here in Oakland and OUSD. Um, for me, I started doing this work in 2012 when the two schools that I had worked at for 10 years were both closed. Um, and over the last 10 years, I've gone from an educator to an advocate, to an activist, to an organizer. And now some people would even call me maybe a politician, which I, I reject. Um, but we've had this, this forward movement. And really during COVID, we've seen it accelerate. And we are now poised um, for transformational change at the back end. And with the amount of one-time dollars that are being made available, it really feels like it's a closer possibility than it's ever been before. Um, for us in Oakland, our schools have been shut down and closed for over a year. We are just starting now to have a limited reopening of in-person. And it's really meant uh, two things, I think, for here in Oakland. Uh, for one, everyone has felt this pain equally. So although we live in a, a city that has huge issues with inequity within our city and from school to school, the pain of school shutdown has been felt across the board, um, more so than previous issues have ever been felt. So in Oakland, we've seen groups of privileged parents coming out of the woodworks demanding full opening tomorrow. Um, and it's been really interesting, and I think a, a, a changing experience for some of those families to have to demand services when they've always gotten services first. And it's really kind of changed some of the political dynamics within Oakland. Um, the other thing for me personally is for a, a lot of years, um, the problem for transformational change, a lot of us thought here in Oakland was in order to bring transformational change, uh, a lot of us thought that we had to tear down the previous system first. And there was always, uh, a lot of us were not willing to tear down our public education system in order to rebuild a better education system at the back end. Over the last year of school shutdown, our education system has been largely destroyed. And so we are looking at a much cleaner slate going forward than we've ever really had before. And so I am hopeful with some new leadership in Oakland, with the amount of one-time COVID relief dollars coming into our city, and uh, that the playing field has been largely um, demolished by COVID, that we really have this historic opportunity to bring transformational change and start to build the kind of schools we've always wanted and deserve in these next three years coming up at the back end of COVID. So as, as traumatic as this experience has been, and Oakland has seen very high rates of COVID uh, during some of this process, we're really starting to get excited about this opportunity that we do see opening up over the next six months. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. So I have a, a follow-up question and you've already started touching on this um, issue, but could you maybe deepen our understanding of what role equity and equality play in these times of transition? Because I know every region is experiencing different things, so that, that would be fantastic. And again, audience, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat as well. Um, whoever wants to go first, if you want to go in the same order, Maya, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I can do that. Um, <clears throat> I think that one question or concern that is really boiling just under the surface of every conversation here is, what the hell is the purpose of an education? Right. What are we talking about? Um, and within that also lies, who are we to decide, right? Um, so where also are we having that process of defining education and also, you know, really interrogating how decisions are made? Um, I did a, a small session. I lead a grassroots teacher fellowship for classroom teachers, and we meet once a, uh, once a month, and we each facilitate, and we did a session on what is the purpose of education and brought in all these you know, things we've been taught and really 
it was astounding because we are all very similarly aligned in terms of values. We all, most of us work in LA, although we have some from different states. Everybody had a different take on what should the priorities be, right? Is it to um, work within a system or is it to push back against a system? Is it to prepare you for a labor force or is it to prepare you to create change within a labor force? What even is our labor force, right? Because these things are changing um, so rapidly and how much power and control are we preparing um, our students to have within that? So I think that, you know, that always has to be the grounding question is what is an education? And also what is my positionality within defining that? Who am I to say what that is for anyone, honestly, beyond myself and potentially my own child? Um, and so when we make these decisions, I think we really need to be looking at who is in the room, who's not in the room, and how, how is power playing out within some of these stances and within some of these visions. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. I think second to that is there's been so much debate about what do we teach, right? What do we teach? Are we going to teach the 1619 project or are we going to go with Trump's patriotic education? Are we going to teach these national centralized common core standards? Or are we going to leave it up to local districts, which in some ways is, is you know, the best definition of equity because it provides local control. In the other way, it's also the very definition of inequity because now you're, you know, that's the well-trodden path of school segregation and, and having a lot of gaps in, uh, in wealth and resources. So I think that for me, we need to shift this conversation from what are we teaching to really how and why are we educating people um, and how are we involving people within that process so that they are not simply, again, you know, relying on that banking model of we're going to fill you with these standards or these skills, no matter how, you know, idealistic or anti-racist they sound or feel or are packaged as, but how are we involving you in this actual process of co-creating your own reality? Um, I think within that, we also need to look at, I'm, I'm here largely because I wanted to talk about um, the labor crisis and the fact that you know we are so top heavy as an educational system right now we have so many administrators we have so many thought leaders we have so many people who are you know creating and selling curriculum and there to support us and we have so few classroom educators and at a certain point i think you have to pause and say you know we have so many people telling people what to do and they are quite literally driving people away so at what point do we stop and say, you know, what, what are some of the material resources? And I think, you know, educators are part of those material conditions that create a successful educational system. So I think that that is, is really key too, is looking at as well as who is making decisions, but how are those people, when we think about power and we think about power structures and hierarchies, how are we ensuring that the people whose actual labor carries out these visions and realities, how are they part of their own reality? So that's how I would kind of address that question. Um, and I'll just leave, I wrote it down, but I wanted to kind of lift up this quote by Audre Lorde, where she says um, in Sister Outsider that, you know, rather divide and conquer must become define and empower. So I would really push us into thinking about how are we defining some of these terms like equity and equality? And then how are we empowering those very people who we've identified as being at the rough end of inequitable or unequal systems, how are we empowering them to take charge of their own experiences? Awesome. And Mia Mantri just made a comment that she thinks students who are the people for whom decisions are being made, that they should also be part of the process. So that's, that's an excellent point, Mia. Um, who wants to take it next, Ernesto or Mike or Nicole? Hey, Sue, so would you mind repeating what direction you were asking the question again from? Absolutely. Um, I was asking about more, more explanation if you want to chime in about uh, equity and uh, equality. What does that mean in these times of transition, especially in the educational system that you're in? I posted in the chat again. Thank you. Um, when, I was, when I was listening to Maya and, and my, my own thoughts on that, I was thinking that there are certain broad reaching things that could help everyone. Mm -hmm. And some of those things would be like ending standardized testing and making funding at the federal level instead of local property taxes. Um, and also things like free food to everyone, no matter their income, uh, every single day. And 
you know, those are all supports that could reach across so many things. And then, and then, you know, yes, we do need to get into the, the meat and potatoes, so to say, of, you know, what, what are our expectations and where are we getting our content from and why do we feel that that's the best thing to, to do and really what is education? Like, you know, are we training workers? Are we, you know, are we, are we trying to nourish the brain and the soul? Like, well, what is it that, that our ultimate goal is as, um, as educators? And the last point I would make is if anything has become glaring to me as a music teacher is that we need smaller class sizes and that we should have more community schools. You know, for a long time in West Virginia, it was consolidate, consolidate, consolidate. And so you have these communities that are very geographically, um, you know, separate, that it will take 45 minutes to get from one town to the next one because you're in the middle of the mountains, in the middle of nowhere. And whenever the thrift community school closes, not only are you having to bus children to potentially different counties, which are school districts, um, you're also losing the heart of the community. I mean, that's what schools are. They're gathering places. So whenever that you have sports or you have arts or, or whatever it is, that building functions as more than that. Like it is a gathering place. It is a place of pride. And so, you know, we're looking at how are we supposed to keep children distant six feet apart? Well, at the secondary level in West Virginia, there are no class caps. Like once you get to the seventh grade, I mean, I, I taught a middle school choir and I had 62 children in my, in my room. That is dangerous. It doesn't matter how fantastic that somebody thinks I am. Like I cannot, I cannot properly educate those children. I cannot keep them safe. If there was an emergency, I could not properly deal with that. And so, you know, there, like I said, there are broad reaching things that I think that could be set at the federal level that could really help us. And, and part of that would be in the standardized testing making sure everyone has access to free food, you know, putting firm class caps and they, they should be smaller than what we even are willing to accept. I mean, you can have 20 pre-K kids, four-year-olds in West Virginia. That is way too many tiny little babies right. um, for that to be a, a proper education and for safety reasons. Okay, um, Mike or Ernesto? Um, well, in in Puerto Rico, in university, in the university, the I think the question about uh, equality in access to education has a very important because sometimes the issue about access to higher education is reduced to the cost of tuition fees, and that's not really all of it because it's not only the tuition fees. You have to have access to the internet, have room on board, have access being able to maintain your family, because if your family has necessities, you're not going to go to higher education, you're going to go directly to work. And I think that these issues should be discussed. And for example, right now in, in, in the UPR, University of Puerto Rico, uh, in the last four years, the cost of tuition has more than tripled uh, in the university. So it has been a lot of impact uh, in the service of the payment of debt that the government of, of Puerto Rico has incurred. And I think that that's a conversation that's very important to the role of who has access. Every year, the quantity of students going to university is less. Every year, the cost is higher. So people have less access. And the vision of the ones that have power in the administrations is to have a small university for the elite, for the people that have money. And that's a big problem that we have. And that's a different vision of the kind of education that at least I think we all agree here of what should we uh, strive for. And I think that in case of university, there's also the other side of the coin of for whom or for what does the university does work for? Is the university is going to be in function of the corporation that needs uh, people to keep making money or is it gonna be in function of the necessities of the people around it and the communities that it is. And I think that the role equality plays in the transitions that we should strive for, uh, we should take these things into account. All right, thank you. That was so beautifully stated. Uh, Mike? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm watching all the questions in the chat too. I, I think I'm gonna try to tie it together a little bit for what we're trying to do here. Them, but feel free, yeah. 
Okay. Um, and, and really one of the things here in Oakland is the word equity has been co-opted by district leadership for 10 years. So um, we've had it said to us uh, in terms of equity between charter uh, schools and public schools. And the, the word has just been co-opted for a whole decade here. Um, we are looking to reclaim the word. Um, and one of the ex uh, one of the good things about the COVID relief dollars that are coming uh, to the states is that there is an equity formula to these dollars. So for us in Oakland, we are receiving almost $300 million in one-time relief dollars from the state and the federal government. And we have a yearly budget usually of about $650 million. So this is a huge call to our district. Um, a neighboring city, uh, Piedmont, which is where all the privileged rich people live. Um, Oakland is receiving at least 12 times as much per student in dollars as our neighboring city because we have so many students that qualify for free and reduced lunches. And so these COVID relief dollars are being given to states based on an equity formula. And now that I am on the school board, I have one of the seven votes to control how those dollars are used here in Oakland. And so we are trying to use these dollars for transformational change and to address these longstanding equity issues. And really what we're trying to do is two things. We want to raise our base funding level for all of our schools across the district um, to lower class size, to bring a librarian to every school, a nurse, all of those things that we should have at every school <laughs> across our district. We also want to start piloting sustainable community schools as our uh, reparation schools, as our recovery schools. And those schools will uh, get the resources, hopefully half a million dollars extra, like what they're doing in Chicago. And those schools based on community visioning will decide what extra programs they want to bring into their schools. So we are getting extra funding um, because we are Oakland and we have these equity issues and we are really determined that then we can have an equity lens when we are then allocating those resources. And that is how we're trying to use these dollars that we have never had this much money coming into education in a lump sum. We are really trying to use this as the opportunity to bring transformational change and address these historic generational inequities that we've had in our city all along. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, massage all of this forward. The other thing I would really encourage everyone, um, we all really want the same thing. Um, and, and what I'm trying to push people on, especially here in Oakland, is to um, not give up some of our past battles, but see this opportunity that we have with these battles that have been going on for 10, 20 years to direct this battle into the next two years to really push this change forward. You know, just so folks know, um, not only was Oakland taken over by the state of California in 2003, since that day, we have had the highest rate of charter schools in the state of California, in the state with the most charter schools. So Oakland has been ground zero for school privatization. We've been destroyed by outsiders funded by billionaires coming in. And we're using all of this now. Um, this last year has been pretty, uh, pretty hectic here. We're using all of this now as our real opportunity to turn the tide. We've beaten charter schools here in Oakland. We've changed the state law. And we're really determined to use this money to really bring these changes forward. Mike, I'm not sure part of the question that um uh kimberly was asking was how much of that money was going towards debt and pension costs did you answer that part so um some of that still be still to be determined um but so oakland still owes money uh to the state on a state loan long story we shouldn't even owe that money um if we do nothing our state loan will be paid off in four years and that is when we will be free of some of these other strings um, actively work on a plan to use some of these one-time dollars to pay off the rest of the state loan that we owe, which is a little under 30 million. And so hopefully, I'm very hopeful that in the next six months, we will have it completely paid off. We will be completely free and clear of any further state or county oversight. 
and that is a big thing that we're really working towards but there's there's still a lot of massaging to go on in the background because we just still have forces around that don't want us to be debt free to keep us in this condition so we you know i, I want to encourage every let me just change i want to encourage everyone um, to locally look into how much money your state is receiving in COVID relief dollars and how many of those COVID relief dollars are slated to come to your school district. We, it, the amount, the trillions of dollars that the feds are handing out now is, is a historic opportunity. But the thing is in most cities, we do not have positions of control to even know how much money is coming in and what our opportunities are. And so for us here in Oakland, the one thing that's exciting for me is as a school board member, I can at least say for sure, this we know this money's coming in. We know we have these strings still attached to it. Um, and so I am actively working to put together the plan that we will bring transformational change and be free and clear of any state oversight, hopefully in the next six months. And, uh, and for us in Oakland, for those of you in Oakland, this senior district staff are um, are actually the ones who presented the plan to me. So this has also uh, been an exciting experience as three months on the school board, where some of the superintendent and the staff people that we thought would be resistant to these changes have actually been our best allies so far. That's phenomenal. Um, I, I can say that we have also received millions of dollars from the city colleges and they're sitting on them, you know, um, and that, that's a problem. You, you stated something crucial that you have to have the power to make the decisions about how the money is being sent. Um, there's a quick follow-up by Ethel, and then I have a follow-up for Nicole. I think you've answered this already, but Ethel asks, Mike, how will those dollars help us keep our 23 schools in the flatlands? Do you see this as an opportunity to fight the charters and keep our schools open? All right, I'm gonna answer this quickly because I don't want to answer all the questions, just me, and I know there's a lot of Oakland folks sure, here. Sure. So uh, there are no more school closures coming to Oakland. That was my number one platform piece that I ran on. So I can, there's no more school closures. Um, and now that we have so much money that we're sitting on in one-time dollars, that was the reason given for why we needed to close schools was a lack of resources. That reason is off the table. So I can, my top issue was no school closures. I feel really solid about that. My second issue was to end the financial mismanagement of OUSD. We are working on that, but we are also sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars to really uh, fund these things going forward. And the third thing that I ran on is community control over these decisions. Um, and that's really where we're at now. Um, I can't announce all of the plan publicly because there are still some things that could go wrong, but I'm feeling very confident that in the next six months, we're going to be debt free of the state loan. Uh, school closures will be done once and forever. We are working on a new strategic plan and we're gonna fund it with these one-time dollars to bring transformational change. So for those of you in Oakland, for the first time in 20 years, I see a light at the end of the tunnel and it's only six months away. So I'm, I'm really, really excited, but it's gonna take a push from all of us. And then hopefully, you know, it always happens in Oakland first. So if we can have this breakthrough, then we're looking to um, export it down south to LA where they have a, a, an opportunity to really flip stuff now with some of these changes happening. And we start to export these changes, just like they learned how to privatize a school district in Oakland and then took it to New Orleans. We're really looking to try to set an example for how do we regain local control. So there's not gonna be any more school closures. Uh, don't worry about what you saw at the school board meeting with the trustee coming in and saying he wouldn't allow something. In. So let me just say, instead of rambling, we already in the last three months, we have denied two charter schools, only charter schools that came up for a vote. So I'm two for two. This year in Oakland, we have Prop 39, which gives our public school spaces over to charter schools for lease. We had zero Prop 39 leases this year. You know, we got Assembly Bill 1505 passed a year ago, which gives local control over the charter schools. And so we have these series of wins that we've really been racking up. So we are, we are on the move in Oakland. We have beat the charter schools already. And now we are making a play for the strategic plan and to bring transformational change. Thank you, Mike. Oh my gosh, people are so excited. Um, they want to connect with you and stay connected. I do have a question for Nicole, and uh, it's again from Kimberly Moses, and her question has to do with how you build power um, 
if you're building power with rural areas, let me see if I can capture this question. Well, I should probably just go into Google Doc. I know I missed you. Are there any efforts to build power with the larger districts and teachers unions with the more rural areas of West Virginia? How are the organizing efforts to make sure that relief funds and other funding are being invested in the schools? Um, I'm going to be very frank. Yeah. Um, so this, the West Virginia legislative session is blissfully short. It's only from early January till mid-March. Now, I mean, they make $20,000 to be there um, when that's like as much as an entire household makes in West Virginia sometimes. Um, but it was incredibly destructive. Uh, the Republicans are a super majority, like our Democrats would be, you know, <laughs> probably your Republicans in California. Uh, but it's like, they are, they are crazy. Like they are Alec centered, you know, anything to do with privatization. They, they made it illegal for us to be able to take our dues from our paychecks. Um, they've opened the door wider to vouchers and charters, which we still don't technically have in West Virginia. We're too, it's, we're very, very poor. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how that this is supposed to work, but so uh, instead of our, and I, and I am going to be critical, instead of our union leadership seeing this coming because this has been a continual threat for years that um, we're not going to be able to take our dues out of our payroll um, they have sat on it they have they have not updated technology or the websites so that you can just automatically have it drafted from your bank account um, they're they're very antiquated in how that they've approached everything the same people have been in leadership for you know 15 years and they're very much stuck in how things were run 20 and 30 years ago and so there, there has been no effort. There has been no effort to educate membership on what does it really mean to organize? How do you build power? And how do we move forward from this? They have offered no hope. They did not stand up for any of us during COVID. Um, it's, been, it's been a very destructive year. And again, to be very honest, I'm very worried about union membership. Um, I see our numbers bottoming out. I think that it is going to be up to the rank and file. It's going to be up to our caucus, which has continually built power, to step in and say, you know, th this is enough. Like, we do not need leadership. And we should know that as West Virginians. You know, we know what we need, and we're going to be the union that we need to be. And that's going to be, it needs to be centered around educating membership. And it needs to be centered around, this is how you build power. And we can, we can do that. And we are more than capable of that. And so I'm hoping that the summer will kind of give us a break from all the craziness that has been COVID and that people will be somewhat recharged. And even if they are very much, um, there's been a lot of talk of, well, why do I need to pay dues? What has the union ever done for me? And so we need to, we need to rewrite that. You know, the union is not an insurance company. Like you need to get that out of your mind. <laughs> like, like you are the union, you know this, you shut down an entire state twice. <laughs> like, you know how to be that union. Let's remind you of that power. So yeah, it's going to have to be rank and file led, but I, but I am hopeful, even though that things are, are difficult right now. Yeah, we have the same struggles, but I think one of the problems is also these right-wing attacks that are going after people so they can leave unions that are also a problem and they're suing unions. And so it's not just the union's inability sometimes to, to uplift the rank and file members or do this in a way that's a true solidarity, but you know, eh, so maybe that's something we can talk about later because unions are under attack. You know? Can I make one one small yeah, point? Please. So something that our union has been stuck on for years is that elections have consequences. That has been their tagline forever and ever. And we all know it doesn't matter how friendly a legislator is, they're never going to go as far as you want them to. It depends on who you have that are organized that are pushing for that. Like I was a Bernie bro all the way. Mm -hmm. And even if Bernie was our president, he would have never went as far as I wanted him to go. So I really feel like that, that's, that, that needs to be a shift too. Like, you know, we need to get away from friendly politicians. Like, yeah, it makes things easier. That'd be great. But that isn't the end all be all. You have to organize your people and build power. Yep, absolutely. Excellent, excellent points, everyone. So we're at five until three or four until three. And uh, maybe just one more question. This is an Oakland question that came from uh, Kimberly King. She says, uh, it's great that we aren't approving new charter schools, but do we still have a lot of charter schools in Oakland who are, or that are getting uh, public school dollars? Maybe a quick yes, no. Mike, you say no? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had to switch to a hotspot. Can you can you say that again? I have really bad Wi-Fi here. Even though charter schools are not uh, being uh, approved, 
Do we still have a lot of charter schools in Oakland that are getting public school dollars? So um, unfortunately, we, we can't close every charter school tomorrow. And Oakland is at a rate where about 30% of our students are in charter schools. And so um, the passage of Assembly Bill 1505 was really big last year, which for the first time um, reformed the charter law to give local school districts real reasons to deny charters. And so that's how this year as a school board director, we have denied the first two charter applications that have come up. And actually one of those was a material revision. And when we denied it, that charter school two weeks later voted to close at the end of this year and they are giving up their charter. Um, that's why having no Prop 39 leases where none of them are getting new leases for our public school spaces is a huge thing. So what we had to do is first we had to put the state law in place um, to be able to check charter growth. That's in place. Now we had to elect a different school board to enforce uh, those laws. Uh, that's what we did. And so now there will be no more charter growth in Oakland and we are already seeing a decline in uh, charter school seats by the decisions we're forcing them to make. The other thing that's gonna be really big coming out of the pandemic is uh, in Oakland, again, 30% of our students attend charter schools. Some of these charter schools will not be reopening as our public schools reopen. They don't have the same institutional momentum to say, yes, you need to reopen. They took all their PP, uh, PPP loans and all of this extra money and they'll never reopen again. And so, you know, just like during the pandemic, it was public schools that was providing food to charter school students. Charter schools haven't even been required to run programs during this pandemic. So um, in a lot of ways, this has been even more disruptive for them. And what we did in Oakland is we broke the stranglehold. You know, it took in three elections, three times running for school board, uh, Michael Bloomberg and the billionaire spent a combined million dollars against me for Oakland School Board District 5. And, and we broke them off in this last election. Uh, it is very clear the charter schools know that we won, but I need people just to be a little patient because it took 20 years for it to get this bad. So I am very excited in less than 120 days, the dent that we've already put into it. Um, and we are now finally moving in the right direction. It's just gonna take a few years. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to take a, a short break and uh, you're going to hear the lovely words of Adam Gottlieb, um, who has written a wonderful poem called Pedagogy of the Poets. Adam Gottlieb is a member of the Legal Revolutionaries for New America Chicago chapter. He's a singer, a singer, pardon me, musician, um, songwriter uh, for the band One Love. And we're going to watch a video and see him perform a, a piece that he wrote with a lot of love for teachers and students. Uh, my league comrades asked me to do Pedagogy of the Poets. I also wrote it in the 2012 teacher strike, not the 1912, uh, not to be confused. Um, okay, it does start with a couple quotes from uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. Um, Education either functions as an instrument which is used to facilitate integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system and bring about conformity or it becomes the practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. This then is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed to liberate themselves and their oppressors as well. Pedagogy of the poets, this is our classroom this cipher, this circle, this open mic to amplify our voices, this talking stick, this ritual, this space where we are all teachers and students and our conversation is the lesson. Voices and dialogue, concert, testimonies, meeting, alchemizing in the air. This is our eternal truth, our only theory, our sacred text ever changing. We are movement, evolution, truly human being praxis. We practice the art of speaking and listening. The word and the silence are the legs on which we walk. The word to name ourselves and the world. The silence to hear what others are saying. The word to know, to defend, to dream. Silence, soil to receive these seeds.
This is the garden, the ecosystem. This is art and age-old wisdom. This is the theater. This is the stage. This is the altar on which we pray. This is our church and our town hall, our Congress and congregational. This is our government. We are the legislators. This is our classroom. We are the educators. Capitalist pedagogy works top down. Study for the test, listen up, shut your mouth. Standardized curricula written by the state, memorizing disconnected facts for a grade. Keep it compartmentalized. Don't connect the dots. Teach them to be satisfied with the poverty they got. Never use the word oppression. That's unpatriotic. Don't teach ethnic studies or you'll go to jail. Got it? Water down the history. Literature, social studies, out with creativity. We don't need critical thinkers, do we? In a system where the vast majority of jobs are to slave away for minimum wage working for a boss. But something new is happening. Now even that is gone. Automated labor has created a new problem. They don't even need us in their factories no more, but they do need us in warehouses so they can win their war. So they close the public schools when they want to make a buck. But when COVID puts our lives at risk, they do not give a fuck. They say we got to open schools up, the ones we haven't closed, because we don't care if you live or die. And where else would you go? Maybe jail, maybe prison maybe concentration camps, while they beef up the police state and they bail out the banks, closing clinics, building condos, putting people on the street. That's the kind of education we gonna get from the elite. If this shit ain't fucking fascist, well then I don't know what is. Tyranny of corporations, slavery inc. Light footin' buddies up in city hall huddle like a pack of vicious vultures to callously shutter up another housing project till there's not even one left. Selling public schools for a charter paycheck. Packing 50 students in a class with old books, cutting back special ed, art and music go first, then it's nurses, counselors, janitors, lunches, gross meat soon enough. They're sitting in a room with no heat, but it's all about the kids, right? Lori's on our side. It's not her fault we've got an educational apartheid. It's gotta be the teachers. Them motherfuckers lazy. Better bust their unions up, cut their payment, raise fees, call me crazy. But I think I see a pattern. They're taking away our basic needs while they keep getting fatter. Their politics are like their classes, just monologues. Turning schools into prisons, soft holocaust. All of us now have to make a decision. Keep trying to fix a broken capitalist system or redesign society. Unite for a new vision where everyone participates and everybody listens. This is why we make a space for everyone to talk. This is what democracy looks like, hip hop. This is our pedagogy. This is why we rock the mic and we pass it so the cypher don't stop. Thank you. Wow, incredible. Yeah, let's have a round of applause for Adam. It's always great to hear his poetry. Um, so yeah, we have uh, we have some more questions. I want to uh, bring in one from the chat. Uh, this is a question um, from Louis Quindon. Oh, uh, sorry, Louis Quinslin. Um, and I think it relates to some of the things uh, Adam mentioned in the poetry about. Uh, so what about the the people? Who are um, who are left out of the system? So Louis asks, "What are we doing for the kids who have disappeared from our high schools? Uh, without high school diplomas, they are denied financial aid to college and most apprenticeships. This will also impact enrollment in community colleges." Um, so yeah, I mean, this the public education pandemic uh, affects kids in the public school system and also those that affect it has left behind. So uh, if any speaker would like to address that. Yeah, I will. Um, I, I guess I'd like to reframe that question and, and maybe the previous question as well. Um, after a little bit of reflection, I think the question itself says, what are we doing for those students? No. Um, what are they doing for themselves? Right? They're, they're living. They're alive. Where are they? Right, like go go find them. I think that this is really, you know, on the tail end of Adam's poem. This is this is the problem that I'm seeing, and and no call outs, but always, always, always driving towards criticism. This is the problem: is we have assembled this panel of folks to sit here and talk about 
what we need to do for others, right? And like, no disrespect to Mike, who I just met, but I've been following you on Facebook and like, I know you'll appreciate this push, but like Mike comes here with the most formal power. He's also the person getting most of the questions and we're acting like he has all the answers, right? And like, he's a person. And I think that's real dehumanizing for Mike as well, because like Mike wants to work with the community. I know him well enough from following him that I know that's his work. So if we wanna work with the community and engage people authentically, I also think we have to take a step back and realize like, what is the, what is the purpose of a panel, right? And I'm really struck by that, that line that Adam offered that the conversation is the lesson. So rather than go in and say, what are we going to do for these students who have been quote unquote left behind, number one, we need to interrogate, what are we looking at as success? What would it mean to us to have these students be successful? And what kind of white supremacist capitalist bullshit came into our heads when we decided that? Number two, how are these kids living, right? What can we learn from them? So I think that a lot of it has to, when we answer these questions of what are we doing for people, it really has to be reframed as what are people doing for themselves? When we ask what role do ed equity and equality play? Nah, the question is what role are we playing in equality and equity? Because we are taking the humanity out of our own questions, which means to me, we're having the wrong conversations, which then back to Adam's point and poetry, we're missing the lesson, right? If the conversation is the lesson, Let's get the right conversation with the right people so we can learn the right lesson. Wow, yeah, thank you so much. I think that's a really important part. This is something that we're all building together by its very nature. You know, this isn't something that uh, a better public education system can't be imposed from above. It has to be built from the ground up. Um, and I, I do wanna tie this into this next question uh, and maybe we could ad address this um, th that we, and so this is also something we've been talking about how, uh, uh, Maya, in your previous comments, you, you mentioned, okay, so what do we mean by a public education system? There have been talks about, uh, what's the purpose of this public education system? So if our, our speakers can respond to, uh, one, who is having these conversations? How can we have these conversations in our classrooms, in our communities? Uh, you know, with our students, um, I think it was Maya from the chat who mentioned, you know, the students are the people who are so often left out of these conversations when it's them who are impacted most. So how do we bring these conversations uh, into our communities? And also, uh, I mean, of course, we we don't have everyone represented here, but I think on this panel we do have a wide range of um, of people involved in public education in different ways. We have students, we have teachers, we have school board members, mothers, uh, union members. So uh, and uh, of course we want our audience to participate. So how do we begin that? Uh, so I want to bring in the question of what do we need public education to be? Um, and of course, again, this is a question for our entire community. Uh, but here we can begin that conversation uh, and begin listening and uh, coming up with the answers. But what, what changes do we need in public education for our youth and for the future of our planet? Uh, what does it need to be? Can I, do you mind if I speak first? Go ahead, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I was gonna be kind of, my thoughts, which of course aren't all encompassing, but like whenever, I feel like it's important for us to dream even bigger than we feel like is possible. And, and I'll give you a real life example. I never thought that I would participate in a statewide strike. Like I was just happy to get 15 people at a union meeting. And so this dream of us shutting down an entire state was just that. It was just a dream for a very long time. And the fact that it happened is still shocking to me. Like, I'm still thinking that didn't really happen. <laughs> um, and so like, it, whenever I think about what, what I want, you know, my, my children are 10, eight, five, and four. Um, there's only five months difference between my two youngest ones. And when I think about the type of education that I want them to have, or the type of school that I wanna teach in, I think about things like 
beautiful facilities that the top floor is not condemned, which is what the local high school that I work right next to, the top floor is condemned and they're still teaching classes on the main floor. Um, I think about uh, an, an abundance of art opportunities, that it's not just one music teacher and which I've called up to 800 kids before, just me, all on my own, and somehow supposed to make magic happen with that. And, you know, and I'm not the expert in everything. Like, I think I do fairly well at elementary education. I was a vocalist, but there needs to be someone for strings. There needs to be someone for instrumental. There needs to be someone for theory. Like, in my mind, I feel like the public education should nurture. I feel like the school day should be shorter. There should not be an expectation of homework. Many of our children have to work, um, which again, I wish that that wasn't a reality of our society. But many of my children have to work in order to help support their families, or they take care of younger siblings because there's no other childcare opportunity um, or option. I feel like that our school should be a place where the children get to drive what content is that they want to, to participate in. You know, yes, there, there should be basics. Like we want our children to be able to read. We want them to be able to do the math, to, you know, to build upon that. But if a child is really interested in studying, you know, how buildings are put together, or a child is really interested in how to repair a saxophone, you know, why shouldn't we provide that opportunity? Why should it be so rigid with one person standing at the front of the class and us in a grid formation and that being the end all be all. When I think about what I want my children to participate in, I want them to be able to explore. Like childhood is this magical, quick experience that we all get and, and at varying degrees, you know, poverty can, can it can rob you of, of, of the childhood that, that you deserve. But I'm thinking like what better time to really explore who you are and what you want to learn than when children are young. Why not give them that, that very full and nurturing environment where that they know that they are safe, they know they are part of a small class size, they do not have to fear a police officer being in their building, they know that there's a nurse there if they get sick, they know that they're going to have meals provided or there's an opportunity for them to take food home. And I feel like it's possible. It's possible to do all these things. So when I think about you know, what do I want education to be? I want it to be this environment where, yes, we learn the basics, but then we get to drive what it is that we're interested in, you know, and that can change from one day to the next. That can change from one year to the next. You know, I remember thinking that I sang pretty, but I didn't have the opportunity to, I, I didn't know how to read music when I went to college, guys. <laughs> like, I just sang pretty. And thankfully, the, the university that I went to gave me a semester to learn enough to pass a proficiency exam. And now I'm a relatively successful music teacher for 12 years. And I can read music and I can teach instruments and I can play instruments. But I didn't have that opportunity in high school. And so I have always been playing catch up as an adult. So yeah, I feel like that we should dream bigger and that we should have incredibly high expectations and that we should not compromise. I think that's something that we have been socialized to accept is that we have to compromise. We have to compromise as a parent. We have to compromise as an educator. And we have to compromise as a union member. And I'm just, I'm just tired of the bullshit. Like I don't want to compromise. And I want us to be able to dream and have this world that not only we deserve, but even the people that we'll never meet that will live well beyond our ears deserve. And thank you, Nicole. I, oh, hopefully I can, I can just jump in real quick. I, I really appreciate what Maya <laughs> said before. Um, and, and yes, and I feel uncomfortable when all the questions start to be directed towards me. Um, so two, two things quickly. We've heard estimates in Oakland that up to 30% of our high school students um, we've lost track of. And so, you know, we are in a worldwide pandemic. We are going to have to do a lot of work on the back end um, to see how many students and at that point adults we can recapture that we know have fallen through the cracks that exist in the system. And so we really don't know right now what the impact's going to be, but hopefully uh, as a community and as a school district, we, we can come up with a dedicated plan to address it. Um, because if we don't specifically address it, those students will be lost forever. Um, and just one other thing, I've, I've been on the national circuit before the pandemic for almost three years uh, with Journey for Justice National Alliance. Uh, and my talking point has been, uh, we do not need unions or anyone to organize us. 
what we need is people and unions to support the organizing that we're already doing. And so, you know, there is no student on this panel. Um, it is not up for us to say what the students need at a certain age, especially. Our communities are smart. Our communities know what's best for them. And so I, uh, it took me a while, but I've learned how to be an organizer. And that is the model hopefully we can replicate in more places where if we support the community and the organizing that they're already doing, the community has no problem expressing what they want and what they need. And so I think that's also the dynamic that I heard Maya touching on is, you know, for me, I, I came up through the community, you know, I've, I've sat in enough protests to last me a lifetime. Um, but that is what I brought to the school board. It is because we needed to bring our organizing into the spaces of power. It's not that I ran for office and then I'm going back to the community to say, here's what you need to do. And so hopefully we can just really, you know, we have to keep in mind the, the privilege that we all have here on Zoom that most of us you know, went to college or have a college degree. And real that, where that really puts us in this country compared to the communities that we're working in. By definition, we are privileged and we need to just be very careful when we're talking about what the community needs that we're not speaking from that point of privilege and we're really always um, explicitly working to lift up the community voice because they can always express what they need. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and I, I want to bring in Ernesto because, yeah, he is, uh, he is a student on this panel. And um, I wanted to ask you about uh, kind of, well, so when I was an undergraduate, I, there were, I was in a liberal arts university, and there was kind of a lot of uh, talk about different pedagogies and more liberatory pedagogies. But at least the way I thought it was always kind of at a superficial level. Maybe they um, put the chairs in a circle or something. Um, so I wanted kind of to ask you about your experience with uh, uh, and your involvement with the community, with students uh, in, in being critical of our education system and redefining what, what type of education system we need uh, for our youth and for the planet. Well, I think that there's, uh, there's the thing, right? The, like the vision that one has for the education, but there's also the part when one is a student and is part of a space, uh, being a university, being a school. I think that there's a lot, especially in the higher levels, a lot of uh, push to the side of the students because they're, they're young people. Um, they're not adults. They don't believe they have uh, reasoning. Uh, they don't, they sh then they shouldn't participate. And I think part of the movement of the student movement, at least in our experience, is is putting that a different kind of education. Where even in our own classroom, we discuss the curriculums that we want to take. We discuss what departments that we want emphasis. Uh, because here in these budget cuts, we students do not have representation in the in the governing board of the university. And I think that's a very important part that the student needs to be more proactive in the participation and designing of these curriculums um, and the thinking of another possible word that, that could be possible. And not only that, but also exercising the power in the streets to be able to be heard and to be able to change the way that education is being offered and what is being teach in our schools and our universities. And I, I like a part of the poem that was presented that he thought about we are now in this classroom and we are our own legislators, we're our, our, own, our own government. And like uh, a university is like a microcosmos of the, of the world we live in, right? We have, we have different classes, we have racial discrimination, we have patriarchy, we have a governing board, uh, difficult in access. And th that's something that must be discussed, openly discussed and, and that that's mu must be bring in the table. And I think that the education that we need for the future should address these issues present in our own spaces of studies, should address the, should address the violence, the gender balance that we live a lot inside the universities. Uh, we should address the racial balance, the accessibilities of all the working class and different students uh, to access to those, to those resources. So, I think that in that education should be oriented to address those issues and be discussed and also being brought to the public eye. 
and being discussed as a collective to bring the change on and how we can organize to, with, to get the power to make those changes. Outstanding. So uh, I love it. I, I love um, your visions and, you know, community schools and schools that address systemic issues and collectivity. All that is wonderful. And I think that's what a lot of us want. Um, but the final question we have, and then we're going to open up to, uh, there's been a number of questions from, from uh, our, our viewers and audience. It has to do with um, what can we accomplish the changes we need under the current system? And we added another question that we thought was important. I'll put it in the chat. How can we get the power to make these changes? Some of you have already been talking about um, grassroots organizing, but if you have any other ideas to share, that would be great. All right. Do you want me to start again or? Yeah, whoever wants to go, go ahead, Maya. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the answer is no, or we wouldn't be here, right? Like if, if we felt like a system was functioning, then we wouldn't be putting on events like this. Um, I think we, again, you know, I'll return to that point about defining things. We need to ask what a working system would look like for us. Um, I will also say that, um, you know, there's a lot of, whether we're talking about abolition or, um, you know, equity, there's a lot of very rejectionist language floating around. I think this kind of comes from a capitalist mindset of, of commodity, we'll take it or we won't, right? Which is also reflected in elections, I'll vote for you or I won't. Um, very yes or no surveys, right? Here are the pre-made options for you. Um, you know, it's, it's very checkbox, it's very commodity, it's, it's not participatory. Um, and so within that, I think that you know, there's a lot to be said for the things we don't want and the things we're seeing and the things that we don't have. Um, I go back to a, a woman who's a, who was a mentor um, for my family, Grace Lee Boggs, who talks a lot about moving from rejection to projection, right? And we are the leaders that we've been waiting for. And when we talk about building power or how do we get the power, we have it. We already have it. We've always had it. And so it's so frustrating to me to sit in rooms you know, with, with folks like Nicole has described these incredible, brilliant, resilient children and adults who have just survived and, and made the most creative options out of the most horrific conditions. And we sit there and say, well, what can we do? What have we been doing for the last, you know, 200 years since public education got started? So I guess I would ask, you know, a couple things. And, and this also relates to a question my friend Nick from Oakland asked in the chat. How can we make our unions more democratic? Right? A union is, is a system just like anything else. And it is as woke and as active and as organized as its rank and file. And so I think the first thing is being really cognizant and conscious of identities. You invite the people who are missing. You figure out why those people who are missing are not there. And I'm gonna tell you right now, one of the reasons they're not there is they don't speak your language and they need childcare. Those are two of the biggest barriers to access that just uh, affect incredibly wide swaths of people. You keep the chat open. Thank you so much for keeping the chat open. I am so sick and tired of going to events where I can't see the faces of the other people on Zoom and I can't communicate with them. I am voiceless and I am faceless when I'm trying to actually make changes happen. I think we go get the information like Mike said, right? Mike has directed us to some questions like how much money, who makes those decisions? A lot of these things are available online and I know we can read. So we also have to empower ourselves to go do some research and some of the things we tell students to do. And then lastly, I think we really need to move from this very deficit. I mean, this is what we resist in our education systems and with our students. We have to move away from this deficit-based thinking towards, well, we don't have this and we don't have this and we have this problem and that problem and we don't have funding and start looking at what the hell we do have, which is like, number one, our own bodies. Number two, we have our own labor, which is crucial and key. Number three, we have our own histories. And if we have lived in and are from these communities, we know the enormous traditions of success and organizing and change that come out of these communities. So how are we relying on those lessons? We have our elders who have lived through these and are ready and willing to share all of their knowledge with us 
And last but not least, I think that, you know, when we when we buy into this idea of we're going to burn systems down, I think two things come up. Number one, we get really scared and we talk a lot about what we can't do. And I just want to say that we can't it, the first rule to changing the first way to change a rule is to break it. Right. And so I'm, I'm getting I'm getting so frustrated with organizers and activists talking about, well, we can't do that because it's illegal or we can't do that because we'll get in trouble or we can't do that because it could have this consequence. Trouble is supposed to have consequences, right? And I come, come to this from like a very privileged place, but it's a privilege that is also lends me my strength. So I just wanna shout out that not only is my mom here, but my boss is here. And these are the people and the systems that support and sustain me. These are the people who help me share those consequences and help make sure that I'm going to stay fed so I can keep my big mouth open. So we have to start thinking about what privileges do I hold and how do I turn those into risks, right? How do I fuck things up, get in trouble, take the heat? What are you going to do even in your classrooms? Like we hear a lot about like, I have to administer this test. You really don't. You really do not. And you might get written up. And you might get suspended, but the more of you who refuse to do it, the more likely it is that that consequence can be shared and the more likely it is you're actually going to change the rules. And then the second thing I wanna say before I finally shut up and pass the mic is that when we engage in this burn it down rhetoric, what are we left with, right? Have we done the development and the education to build something new? Or are we just gonna be standing in the ashes and the only way that we know how to rebuild policing or an economy or a school system is to do what we've already seen. So a lot of it, especially, you know, if we're talking about education, how often are we practicing the things that we ask of our students and our own schools? How often are we engaging in reading and study and conversations and research to figure out, okay, here's how I'm going to build something better and now I don't have to burn down the whole thing just to rebuild that thing that was actually helping people. I can practice discernment and be really specific and targeted in my vision. So thank you so much. Absolutely. I love the concept of vision. Um, very good. Anybody else? How do we build power or? I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I, just, I think the, the other part of it, at least what's been really helpful for us is uh, some of these larger alliances, especially the Journey for Justice National Alliance, that has allowed uh, us to learn from other cities and to share what we've learned here with other cities. And so, you know, in 2012 in Oakland, when we were experiencing school closures, uh, at the end of the year, we had a 17 day sit in and occupation at one of our schools. Uh, a year after that, is when Journey for Justice was formed and I was in conversation with G2 Brown and Coco in Chicago and kind of uh, spurred them on to their diet hunger strike where they had a 34 day hunger strike, um, which then led to uh, a lot of activity in Chicago and working with their teachers union, which then we adopted here. You know, I was lucky with Journey for Justice. We went to Puerto Rico um, with FMPR hosted us in August of 2019 only weeks after folks had been in the streets, um, which fe really felt like a revolution to us. And that then inspired us to take things to the next level. And so I think not just organizing in the community, but us sharing information with each other. You know, I know that Chicago's trying to get an elected school board. We, we try to support that because we're lucky we do have an elected school board. And so I don't think the the model exists yet that we're all trying to push towards. So this, this common conversation and learning from each other has just been really instrumental for us. And if we weren't in these conversations with other cities across the country, we would not have been able to move things to where we have. Beautiful. Um, anybody else in this question? I, I can jump right in. I... Well, from my perspective, I, I see, well, the university that I aspire and that uh, the student movement in general aspire to be, to be a university that takes active action, active part in the national issues that happen uh, in Puerto Rico and inside the university and all the system and uh, aspire to make changes to it. And as a university that aspires to do that and that takes active part in those issues, 
it will be very hard and very difficult to coexist in a society that have patri uh, that have patriarchy, that have racial oppression, that have class oppression persisting and existing. Especially since the university is not in a vacuum; it's part of the workforce of the capitalist system of productions. Our students are forced in the in the vision that they're trying to impose in our university to have to work and study and get in depth at the same time. Each day we have to practice more worker student solidarity and being part of all the things that we as students also feel oppressed as while working and studying. So I don't, I don't, it's not able to coexist a university that takes part and denounces these issues, that denounces our colonial status in Puerto Rico, that denounces the federal funding scheme that that instigates the debt uh, creation of the students. And I think that it's not possible to coexist as a colony of the United States uh, in a capitalist system that does not value uh, the different curriculum and departments are teaching our universities and also in our schools. So uh, the question is, but are we able to uh, change this system right now? Immediately, I mean, well, not. We have to organize and we have to keep discussing what we can do and how we can change and make way to this better society and to this better university and education system. And for that, we have to create power in our organization. That's right. Nicole? I, well, I'm going to take it just a slightly different uh, direction because uh, I feel like that everyone else touched on such beautiful points that there's no point in reiterating. Um, but I want to talk specifically about being an educator and what the union can do to facilitate. So what Maya said about, um, you know, asking folks, what is the barrier? What can we do to make sure that you are more involved? What, what would make it so that you feel comfortable to be part of this conversation, to be part of this meeting, whatever it is? That's something that um, is so important that typically unions don't do well, uh, or the union leadership. You know, the union really is all of us, and I think sometimes we forget what that definition really means. But something that I'm really passionate about that I think kind of touches on what Mike said um, in a previous conversation too, is that we should be organizing and bargaining for the common good. Like that, that the power that we hold as an organized workforce, and especially that we're between 75 and 80% female, um, is that we have kind of a unique vision and a unique view into our communities. And with that, we have a unique connection to the people living in those communities. And what better way to use that position as in to find out what's important to the community? Like what would make their lives better that is going to affect how that their children are able to function in the educational system? Um, you know, when I, was, when I was young, my family was very, very poor. And, my mother worked three jobs and I was a very mediocre, to put it nicely, student. And she just could not do any more than she was doing. There was no homework help. There was no extracurricular things. There was no transportation. There was no money. Um, I, I was lucky if I got, you know, a new coat for winter. And, and that was just kind of what it was. And I've taught those children um, because many, many of my children come from generational poverty. And I just keep on thinking, how is it that we can better engage to make the world a better place with this organization that already exists? And I mean, like I was telling Peter, the reason I was like late to kind of get on is the entire water for my town is out because it took so long to get grant money to replace the pipes, whenever that they replace a new one, it blows up the old one. So it's like this continuous, it's been a week long of water on and off. And there are communities in West Virginia that have been on a boil water advisory for 12 years, or that they have, they don't have an actual sewer system. It's just straight pipes that go into the creek. And then of course that creek water is pulled back up to be, you know, treated. And so it's just like, it's like this kind of systemic thing. And so my, my point is, is that I feel like that we are in this very unique situation to maybe see things that not everyone sees. And we should use that as a way to figure out, well, well, why is it that certain people don't feel like that they can be involved? 
and how can how can we make that so that they are and how that because everything's connected you know if my mom had been able to work one job I wouldn't have struggled so much and my teachers wouldn't have been probably beat themselves up thinking why can't she learn this and it you know it's it's all connected so yeah so I feel like that there is so much potential with our unions and that we need to make sure that we use that in the best way possible to make the world a better place and that we should continue to dream bigger than even we think is possible. 100%, I couldn't have said it better, it's brilliant and beautiful. Um, so you're getting a lot of props in the chat, people are loving your messages, your ideas. But uh, Ethel uh, Longscott has a question. She says, um, it's not just one thing, it's everything. So important that we figure out how do we build on our common plight? So I'll speak to this question of unity. How do we come together in a broader movement? Is that, that kind of it, Ethel? Who wants to build on that? Yeah? Okay. No pun intended. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in then. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to step back a little bit. Um, so one of the things that, that a lot of us are starting to look at now, even nationally, is now that we have been developing a public education platform and organizing around these issues uh, uh, directly involved with public education is how do we now link up with other groups and start to really push quality of life platforms. Um, we see that happening locally in Oakland. We see some national groups engaged in that, even like with the Poor People's Campaign. And I know Journey for Justice, we are having a national uh, virtual rally on May 17th, um, bringing these issues together. So in Oakland, it's not just the issue of public education, it's the issue of housing justice. We've been devastated by gentrification and this affordability crisis and one thing starts to pile upon the next and so um, for me and the people I work with we really try to just stay in the public education lane it's real easy to get involved with everything but there is starting to be these explicit steps being taken to put these different one issues together into a quality of life platform and again here in Oakland and at least in most of our uh, major urban cities um, we're facing the same things where uh, the uh, uh, the inhabitants of our major cities who were once forced to live there are now being forced into the outer suburbs. And so this turnover, you know, Oakland's lost half of our black population over the last 20 years. And so we have these uh, problems piling up on top of each other. And so our solution is to organize and to try to organize across issues to try to bring this more together. And I think the Bernie campaign um, saw a lot of that, which was based on some of the work from Occupy. And so there is this growing awareness that uh, things are not fair, things are not, there is no equity within this system. And how do we really look for a new vision of how to live going forward? Excellent. I think my response to that would be that we already have the answers, right? So much of, um, I, th I think that part of, there's this tremendous educational gap that we all carry with us as products of an American education system and even just a global education system that's very invested in, in capitalism. And, and that is that, um, you know, we, we learn this kind of definitive version of history and what it leaves out are the ways in which people have thought before. So um, y'all knew you weren't gonna invite an English teacher without a book recommendation. So um, this, is, this is Howard Zinn's voices. I'm gonna lift this up because Howard Zinn, like cool dude, whatever, but you go find voices because voices are the source texts that Howard Zinn used to put together. And what it is, and I read this with my AP language students this year, we did a chapter a week, for what, 16 weeks? No, there's longer, 25 weeks. And it's really just a very exhaustive anthology of the voices of resistance and the ways in which people have done exactly that, Ethel, the ways in which people have brought together their common plights and exercised their voices. And they document the wins and they document the exhaustive losses. But by the end of the book, not only do I, but now, you know, 25. 16 and 17 year olds were like, damn, we have a much clearer picture of where we need to go because now we've really clarified where we've been before, right? And so we know it didn't work. 
We know why it didn't work. We know what lessons folks learned from all of those moments that didn't work. And we can bring that forward. So I think sometimes we, again, tend to get stuck in this place of helplessness, this place of fear, and we're looking for a hero, right? We're looking for a savior. We're looking for someone to step up with the Biden plan and their little bullet points and say, here's what we're gonna do. I, this single lone, usually dude, I'm going to lead us all down the path of liberation and you just have to do what I say and don't ask questions because that means you're not on the plan, right? So I think that, um, yeah, fantastic um, book recommendations surfacing in the chat. So I think we really need to look at like, again, what have we done, right? We have all of these resources at our disposal and I'm not just talking about like books and college classes, but also go find the old people at your school. Go find the old people in your community, right? And just ask them questions. Nobody asks them questions and they love to talk even more than we do. So I think we really need to look at where have we been? And I describe it to my students as a movie, right? If you show up in the last 15 minutes of a movie, nothing's gonna make sense, absolutely nothing. And when the movie ends and you're like, you're not gonna know, you know, up from down. So for me, it's a large part of, and, and to me, it's almost like a moral and an ethical responsibility and obligation to know who came before you, who did you inherit this system from, and from there, what lessons can you take forward? So I would definitely invite us to kind of launch into further study and, and start to use that beautiful internet um, to, to engage with answering our own questions so that we are not susceptible to then following saviors. Great advice. So we can open up, we are at uh, 3.43. Um, if there's a question we missed, or you want to ask a question of our panelists or panelists of each other, by all means. And Aaron, if I missed anything in the Google Doc. Okay, Kimberly, go uh, ahead. Yeah. She has a police question. Uh, a moderator may need to unmute Kimberly. No, I think she can she can do it. Uh Miha, unmute and ask a question or I can't find her. Oh, there you are. Hold up. Okay, there we go. Oh, hi. I just, hi everyone. I just wanted to ask, I know there's uh, been different motions on the campuses around the country. My question is, has police abolition or police reform been something uh, addressed at your school um, in terms of the school to prison pipeline and, and how has it been dealt with if it has been? I can start by mentioning there are efforts at the UC. There's a COPS off campus coalition and abolitionist student groups uh, that are working on this, but I also want to hear what the panelists have to say. Yes, um, it's a tremendous movement within Los Angeles. I will say again, look, I got a pile of books on my desk. Okay, this is the other one you need to go track down and read. Um, like, yes, like now, and, and it's good, it's like a real, it's super accessible. Um, it's thin, it's thinner than the last one. But I think that, um, yeah, I believe it's Ruth Gilmore Wilson asks us that within abolition, um, that it's, it's really about, you, you change everything, right? You don't just take out police, you change everything. So it's not the abolition, is not the absence of police, I think this is, this is her quote, it is the presence of life-affirming institutions. And that to me is the, the absent and most important part of the conversation is, sure, we can yank police off campuses, but have we made the need for them obsolete, right? Or are we still gonna keep knee-jerking into, well, now we gotta call social workers, or now we gotta call the parents, or now we gotta call counselors, or now we have gotta call administrators, and now they're just filling in and doing the job of policing. I think it really takes, what do, why, why did they get there on the first place? What is the function of police on campuses? And then are we going to shift our systems so that that is no longer a need? So the answer is yes and. I would mention um, something to take time to look into is the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Um, it, was a massive disruption that really shocked me. And it takes a lot to shock me. <laughs> um, and something from that talking about police was that 
the way for them to deal with this massive disruption, which started in Martinsburg, West Virginia and spanned a great portion of the Northeastern kind of central uh, part of the states is that they it led to more militia and police forces being put in these um, in these cities and these towns. And so I like I, I just started researching it some, but I, I would say take a moment to look it up uh, whenever that you're talking about police and, and how that they're used to control us as workers and people. And, and last year in, in Oakland for our public school system, uh, it was basically the, the culmination of a 10 year campaign uh, led by a community group black organizing project, which is almost all student led also. Um, and it culminated last year in a unanimous vote of our school board to disband our school police. Um, and, and this group had started 10 years before when one of our students was murdered by a school police officer. So with last year's activity around the Black Lives Matter movement and a group of students really taking this upon themselves, we now have police free schools in Oakland for the first time going forward. Well, from in Puerto Rico, at least in the university, for example, we have uh, what's called a security corps of the university, right? That's like the tri uh, a security corp inside the system. And I think that uh, historically that security corp inside the university, and especially since the university has a long history of, of massive process and radical progress, the, they have special training and they've been specially trained by special forces of the police of Puerto Rico in how to handle manifestations and how to identify people how to carry out identification and keep, um, I don't know the word for this in English, but carpeteo, they keep a register of all the activists and people that have been part of manifestations and all of that. I think part of the, of the, of the, of the exigencia of the things that, uh, that we protest about is that they have to change how the, the security corp in the university works uh because they have to uh, remove demilitarize demilitarize it functions uh i mean I, it's a security they don't do much work in the security campus except take people to the hospital when they get hurt and maybe if something else happened they call uh, the external police of puerto rico to handle things and it's like a contradictory corp inside the 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 upr Go ahead, Aaron. All right. Minutes left. Go ahead. Yeah, so we just have a, a few minutes left and then we're going to start wrapping up. But I just uh, wondered if you all wanted to make comments on this uh, on this question from the chat uh, from a while ago, which is related. Uh, Rosemary Lee says there, dis there is a discussion throughout the country about abolition education, both in terms of creating a curriculum that will abolish a white supremacy education and also abolishing the police and schools and universities and use the funds instead for other needs such as smaller classes, more counselors, nurses, and psychologists. So I see this, um, this point as uh, tying into uh, this kind of abolition democracy, building uh, democratic schools uh, as we're taking the cops off campus uh, and also to these points of common good bargaining, which uh, which is really exciting to see coming from uh, the union movement and the movement for public education. So um, I, if any speakers want to make any last comments or uh, comment on the relation between abolition and uh, common good bargaining and where these funds can go instead of the police. Well, I think from my perspective, it's really about are you are you trying to reform a system or are you trying to revolutionize a system, right? Like how how far do you want to go? Um, and a lot of that goes back to what I was saying about breaking the rules and risks, right? Is this a system in which we are very much operating through a lens of we are going to break the rules um, because the rules are stupid and harmful, or are we going to change the rules within the system? which takes forever and often doesn't work and often sets us up for compromise. So you can see where I fall on this spectrum. Um, but again, you know, this is something where I have the, the privileges to, to say these things because I know that I have various safety nets 
that will also um, keep me fed in house. So I think that's kind of the first question that I would ask is, you know, what, what exactly is your vision and is it about fixing a broken system or is it about changing a system or abolishing a system altogether, right? Policing in and of itself is not a system. Policing reinforces an existing system. Um, and so I think that one thing I love to do, um, especially to kids, is to ask them to define the system, right? Like use your words, what do you mean? When you talk about the system, who comes into your head? What policies come into your head? Uh, start by drawing the system, right? And then we go around and we share our drawings and we start to talk about what are these conceptualizations because that really determines if we see the system as broken or if we see the system as functioning extremely well. So that would be the first thing. I think we also, there's a lot of ideas about like people aren't succeeding, kids aren't succeeding. What does success look like? Do we want our students to success with succeed within a capitalist economy or are we going to redefine both success and the economy? And are we okay with being called failures for it, right? Am I as a teacher okay with getting written up for things? Am I as a teacher okay with getting ones on the little rubric that they're always surveilling us for? Am I okay with not becoming a highly qualified educator because I'm not jumping through all the hoops? So I think sometimes we can you know, talk big game and it's super idealistic. And then when it hits us on the actual concrete material conditions level, we get really nervous and scared and talk about, well, we have to do something, right? We had to do this, we had to do that. But that's also complicity. So I would also ask us to think about, you know, when we're talking about abolishing systems, what is your role within that? What choices are you making intentionally? You need to own those choices. And part of, to me, justice is you need to own a lot of the harm that you are perpetuating and creating. Schools are harm, harmful. So effing harmful. A lot of my day is based on policing students, teaching them behavior, right? Reinforcing those positive behaviors and punishing them in some way, shape or form when they do not. I know that. I do that every single day, right? So it's about not kind of like, um, you know, kidding myself and saying, oh, I'm this great hero. I'm liberating minds. No, I'm not. A lot of my job is spent oppressing people. So I think taking ownership of that though helps me to understand like, here are the things that are causing me to stay up at night. So here are some of the rules that I'm willing to break. Who's willing to break them with me? What are we willing to do together? Getting other people in power to also take ownership of what privileges they have and what risks they can take. I think that's kind of how we start moving towards these goals. But the first step is always going to be figuring out what the goal is. Brilliant. And uh, we're six love and we want to be cognizant of your time. I think that is a beautiful way to, to end our discussion. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm just going to close out with a few thoughts. And I, um, man, I can't tell you how encouraged and invigorated. I don't know about y'all. I, I saw a lot of like happy, you know, really en encouraging words for all of you. So thank you. Thank you for, for that clear analysis uh, on the problems at hand in public and higher education and in division of what's possible, because that is key. Um, thank you, audience. You made some outstanding comments. Your, your analysis was also great. Thank you for participating. But I just want to, again, leave with a few thoughts. Public education is a public benefit. Like you mentioned housing, healthcare, um, uh, clean water. Education is a human right. Many of you have pointed out the problems of privatizing our educational system. And we just want to emphasize that education is not a commodity. It is not a business. The goal of education should not be so students can compete for diminishing jobs. It should not be tilted so the rich pull ahead while those in underfunded schools stay behind and have even less opportunities as schools close down. Uh, the full mission of public schools should be to prepare the youth for their lives as members of the community and as the people who can solve the terrible crises of this pandemic of economic inequity, of global warming, of all these environmental problems that now threaten human society. And as you pointed out, I think the challenge of today is to create schools that are truly public, that are fully democratic, that are fully integrated and fully funded by our government. Uh, we believe that this means there must be national funding for education 
the ends is fragmented, inherently unequal system of a local and state-based and federal funded school as in Puerto Rico, a scheme that is racist and classist. Uh, we must fight for a public education that meets the needs of all our children, regardless of race or class. And we must guarantee uh, safe learning environments for educators and students from public schools to universities. And I love what you've all said about how to build power, how to come together. This cannot happen unless we come together with the broadest possible working class unity. Uh, unions cannot win this battle alone and they need to represent the interests of the rank and file. I really appreciated that analysis, but they have to be as members of the entire community, not just as union members. Um, and we also uh, agree wholeheartedly that parents, community members, students, activists, we all need to come together to guarantee a future for our youth because our children and our students uh, deserve nothing less. So um, we're gonna close out with a few uh, other ways to keep participating. The, these, there are some great events coming up. And Mike, uh, I know it's been put in the chat, but if you want to talk about the D DC Equity or Else event uh, sponsored by Journey for Justice. Yeah, uh, we're just, so we're, we're not in DC anymore. We, we can't go to DC, unfortunately, because it's not really safe to bring 10,000 people to DC. Um, so we are switching this to a virtual event. And this is going to be kicking off our, our next campaign, which is our equity or else campaign. Uh, it's going to be heavy on public education, but we're going to start touching on other issues. And it's just going to be a, a virtual event all online. I really encourage everyone to, to check it out. And um, there are Journey for Justice uh, organizations all across the country. Um, if not Journey for Justice, please find other groups that are already organizing. And, and my last little pitch is, um, please remember, we don't all need to start our own groups. So if you really wanna get more involved, please look around and there's lots of national networks. You can reach out to me or any of the other people involved here and plug you in. And what we're really trying to do is um, not just build up our organizing efforts, but really start to link, uh, I'll use the language, to break out of the silos and really have a united front and really start pushing together. Either it's forcing the new Demo democratic administration to do the right thing, or if you'd rather see it as you know, holding them accountable, now is the time that we really need to press our issues um, to the maximum. We have this opportunity and hopefully events like this will really help us uh, link together and, and really amplify the organizing going on. And Mike, is there a registration fee for that or can anybody come? No, it, it, is, it is free. Please Perfect. register. Uh, anyone anyone can, can go on there and um, you can feel free to reach out to me at Oakland Public Education Network at gmail.com if you have any questions or you can reach out to Journey for Justice nationally and we have a national office that can help too. Brilliant. And then also uh, Rosemary is going to talk about the Trinational um, Conference coming on May 20th and 21st. Are you muted, Rosemary? Hi, thank you. Yeah, I work with, and there are a couple of other people on this call, um, conference with the Tri-National Coalition to Defend Public Education. That was established by um, Mexico, US, and Canada in beginning of NAFTA when education was first defined as a commodity to be bought and sold on the world market. We meet every two years in one of our three countries We've also been joined by Puerto Rico. And we have a conference coming up. It will be delegated, um, but we will also be live streaming it on Facebook in both English and a, a live stream in Spanish. And it, the, our theme this year is transformation of education and educating for transformation. And it's amazing to work with. It's educators at all levels, students and parent groups and activists. For example, some of the indigenous teachers from uh, Mexico are in community run uh, schools really, like one community, for example, the whole, the community decided they wanted their school, um, they wanted to run everything through music. So the whole curriculum is taught through music because that's what's important to that community. But this is a real chance to get together as educators and people involved at all levels of activism around these issues because this privatization cuts across our borders in North America and also worldwide. These testing companies, there's only three that do all the testing throughout the, the world. 
And so it's been an ongoing fight and COVID has just further exposed what's going on. And it, again, it's a matter of we need to transfer education. You know, it's a revolutionary task to change it into something to serve ourselves and the planet in the future. Right. Thank so you, you can, um, I put my email in the chat and you can also look Tri-National Coalition to Defend Public Education as a Facebook group. And that's going to be May 21st and 22nd. And again, it's free. So, so oh, yeah, virtual event. Beautiful. And one more, um, we have one more uh, announcement from Kimberly King, who is going to talk about um, uh, an abolition program coming up in June. Yes, one more free thing. Um, there's a, a panel, the League of Revolutionaries for a New America has been putting on a series of uh, discussions about abolition. And our next one is gonna be on June 5th. It's called The Importance of People's Journalism to the Abolitionist Movement. We're gonna have uh, Ms. Candace Mallett, who actually met through the Occupy movement. It was mentioned earlier, the connection between Occupy and what's going on today. There is a continuity of, of that consciousness that is building. Uh, so Candace now writes a column for the Black, uh, called Black Canary um, that is an anti-capitalist pro-peoples column. So it's gonna be on June 5th. And I'm gonna, I put the flyer in the, uh, in the chat and I'll drop it again, the importance of people's journalism on June 5th, thanks. Thank and you. also on, on uh, sorry, July 17th, we are gonna be having Ruthie Wilson Gilmore speaking. Um, we're really excited for that discussion on abolition. Awesome, great work. Uh, Aaron's going to close us out. Yeah, I just, I wanna thank all of our speakers again so much and I want to thank everyone who helped make this event happen. Um, this event was put on by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. And as these systemic problems like the COVID crisis, the public education crisis, as they deepen, more and more people are brought into the struggle for their basic needs. So revolutionaries are people who understand that systemic change is needed and who are committed to building a society that is healthier, that is safer, that is more free, uh, to a society where the vast amount of wealth that we produce is used for the public good rather than the profit of a few private individuals. Uh, and so one of the first things that a revolutionary learns is that they cannot accomplish this alone. We've talked about this on this panel, that it's not something that's uh, individual, it's not something that's top down, but it needs the uh, input of everyone in the community, and it's, it's fundamentally building up that community and building up those networks. Uh, so the League's goal is to bring together revolutionaries in these various struggles throughout the world, throughout the country, um, and to together, you know, again, not top down, but working together, develop the tools we need and the political understanding we need through conversation to really succeed. Uh, we have a publication, which is the voice of the League, called Rally Comrades. It is in print, it's online, it's on YouTube, Facebook, um, and it looks at these struggles through a political and a strategic lens and conveys a vision for the abundance that is made possible by high technology, but also what is actually standing in the way of achieving this abundance. So we highlight private property. Uh, on one hand, how it prevents that public wealth from being put to public use. And on the other hand, how the written and unwritten laws that private property has, the role that that plays in actually creating these crises in the first place. Um, so again, we're on Facebook, Twitter, we have a website um, and Tezu is putting all that in the chat. And if you wanna contact us, you can look there. You can email us and whoever you found out about this event from, uh, you can uh, ask them for more information. Again, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to all our speakers. It's really been great to moderate this with Hazel.